Welcome and good evening to the City of Shakopee City Council meeting for October 3rd, 2017. If we could please call the roll. Council Member Moko? Here. Council Member Whiting? Here. Mayor Mars? Here. Council Member Lehman? Here. Council Member Luce? Here. Thank you very much. Can we all stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Moving on to item number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes, correction? Corrections, deletions, Mr. Reynolds. Nothing from staff, sir. Okay. Councilor Whiting. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Moko. Uh, discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries, thank you. Item number four, consent agenda. Are there any changes, additions, corrections, Mr. Reynolds? Nothing from staff, sir. Councilor Lehman. Move the consent agenda. <clears throat> second. I have a motion by Councilor Lehman, a second by Councilor Whiting. Um, there'll be no discussion, but before we vote then, we will read the consent agenda into the public record. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. These are consent agenda items for October 3rd of 2017. 4A1 approves the minutes of the August 29 and September 17th, 2017 <coughs> meetings. 4A2 adopts resolution number 7934, which ratifies the Teamsters Union contract for 2017 through 2019. 4B1 sets a public hearing date for a vacation of certain drainage and utility easements in Maple Trails Estates 1 and 2 additions. 4C1 declares four vehicles held by the police department a surplus property and authorizes their proper sale or disposal. 4D1 adopts ordinance number 970, which will repeal city code section 50.15 through 50.99 telecommunications permit and adopts ordinance number 971, which amends city code sections 90.30 through 90.99 right of way management. <clears throat> and 4D2 approves drainage and utility encroachment agreements for 1328 Ridge Court, 1668 Friesian South Street South and 1662 Friesian Street South. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, there is a motion, a second. The consent agenda has been read into the record. There is no discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving ahead then, I believe, to item number five. Now I'd like to call on any resident citizen that would like to come forward and speak on an item not on the agenda. Please come forward, state your name and address to the record, and welcome on an item not on the agenda. Seeing none, we will move ahead then to item number seven, public hearing of vacation of certain alleyways and right-of-ways within the adjacency of the Minnesota Correctional Facility. Councilor Whiting. Make a motion to open a public hearing. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Lehman. Uh, further discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Public hearing is now open and Michael will present. Mayor and Council, this is a request by the uh, Minnesota Correctional Facility <laughs> on behalf of the state of Minnesota to vacate various uh, alleys and rights away. So here's the list. Webster Street, south of 6th Avenue, Cass Street, south of 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue between Adams Street and Webster Street, Washington Street between 4th Avenue and 6th Avenue, 4th <coughs> Avenue between Adams Street and Webster Street, alleys within blocks 5 and 6 of the uh, Copers Edition, alleys within blocks 172 and 173 of the original city of Shakopee Platt. So this is uh, basically what it looks like. They did, <coughs> excuse me, they did do some title work and some of these they're asking to vacate even though we don't currently show them. So we're okay with that. And so the grade areas here would be all vacated. And then uh, staff has requested and was agreed by the applicant and the planning commission for a potential trail easement through this area on their property. So it would be from this point here all the way over to here that would allow to connect this park and the park over here. And the applicant was okay with that. So 
approval of the vacation request uh, with provisions <coughs> for a state grant, a sidewalk trail easement in the 4th Avenue right away between Adams and Cass Streets for future connection between homes and Riverview Park, and the state grant a drainage and utility easement to the city over the 4th Avenue right away because we have a number of utilities in that area. Thank you. Are there questions of staff? I have one uh, concerning this, uh, at least the top half, the most southerly portion. Sometimes they use that for overflow parking for a few events. Um, is there any consideration to allowing a curb cut on 6th Avenue or better access off of, uh, I um, believe, uh, uh, one of those side streets rather than Webster? I would defer to the public works director on that. Okay. Uh, Mayor and council members, um, I am not aware of the event you talk about, but we can certainly talk with the property owner um, and it, it wouldn't necessarily have to hold up the vacations okay. um, the e of the easements here tonight and the right away. Yeah. But we can certainly talk with, uh, with the state and ask them if they'd be interested in that. They just, uh, they hold a handful of events a year that creates uh, folks from out of town coming obviously and overflow parking. They park on that grassy area on the south. They uh, access that on a one-way street on Webster and there's an off-angle uh, uh, cut and uh, sometimes that creates f confusion on a one-way with uh, folks from out of town. So um, just uh, <laughs> thought I would bring it up there. Um, any other questions of staff, Councilor Lehman? <clears throat> I, uh, I asked the city engineer specifically about the alley from, uh, from Cass between 4th and 5th that goes to the west and then wraps around that one way up to the yep. one way, and that's not being vacated, so I know that's used, so I make, sure. Sure that, make sure that wasn't being vacated. Right. I think there's one access to one house there, too. Okay. And the mayor and council, they had requested that and city staff denied that. Okay. Other questions of staff? If not, thank you. Would the applicant uh, or their representative like to come forward and make comment in regard to their application? Please come forward, state your name and address to the record and welcome. Hi there, my name is Roger Behrens. I work in uh, a suburb of Shakopee, city of St. Paul, uh, at the uh, Department of Administration of the state of Minnesota. I'm here representing the Department of Corrections uh, on this vacation. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, basically, all this is is, is a, to clear a cloud on title. You know, we have streets here that were never vacated. Um, we have some buildings on some of them. Uh, uh, parking lots on others, and it's just, it, it's merely a clarification uh, to, to clear out the, the cloud on title. Um, the staff has been absolutely wonderful to work with, by the way. That's the only reason I'm speaking actually tonight is that to uh, congratulate you for having a wonderful staff to work with. They've been great, sort of guiding me through the process. So if there's any questions, uh, that's all I have to say actually. So thank you. The uh, trail, trail aspect is not going to be a problem from your side? No, we can grant uh, the easement um, yeah. as opposed to a dedication. That's something we can do as a statutory matter. And then with the uh, vacation, that's the, the issue I bring up is uh, the access to that overflow parking that is used a handful of times a year. I know it's not part of this request, but if we could uh, take that back and as a takeaway. And your staff knows where to find me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are uh, there questions of staff, of uh, the applicant or the representative? If not, thank you very much. Appreciate it, thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anybody else like to come forward and make comment in regard to this uh, vacation app application? This is a public hearing. Come forward and make comment in regard to this uh, uh, vacation. If not, Councilor Whiting. I'll move to close the public hearing. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Mokal. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Councilor Lehman. Up for resolution 7936, resolution approving the vacation of certain alleys and right of ways within, the, within and adjacent to the Minnesota Correctional Facility. 
Councilor Moko, second. second. So motion by Councilor Lehman. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let's move ahead then to item number eight, a recess for the Economic Development Authority meeting. And we'll call the shock the Economic Development Authority meeting to order. Have the secretary note the roll, please. The agenda should be provided to all members. A motion to approve the agenda would be in order, Ms. Moko. Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Moko, second by Whiting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. <coughs> consent agenda includes the EDA bill list and EDA minutes. Is there a motion to approve the consent? Mr. Marsh. Mr. President, I'll offer the consent agenda as stated. Second. Second by Mr. Whiting. Any questions on the consent? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. Motion to adjourn would be in order. Make a motion to adjourn to Wednesday, November 8th, 2017 at 7 p.m. Second. I'll second that, motion Mr. By President. Ms. Moko, second by Mr. Mars. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. We're adjourned. Thank you. We'll reconvene the City of Shockby City Council meeting for October 3rd, 2017. We are up to 10A, a discussion on tax increment financing. And uh, Michael will present, or Mr. Reynolds, I apologize. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Kursky will be presenting on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a overview of, there's been lots of questions, so we thought it would be good to have a discussion about tax increment financing. We have um, our expert, Tom Dunaway, is here from Springstead who can ask or answer any technical questions. So he's also available. Uh, raise your hand. There you go. So tax increment, tax increment financing, we'll call it TIF to make this go a little easier, is designed to help projects make up a shortfall on a project that <laughs> creates jobs, creates new investment in specific areas of the city, is used for improvements that would otherwise be paid for through bonding or use of general fund dollars, and it can also be used to create affordable housing. So a quick example of how TIF has worked in Shakopee. We're on our, I believe our 17th district um, that's in place right now, so that's a fair number of districts. This was the Site 1988 of where um, Seagate is today, the total taxes paid to all of the taxing districts was $24,067. Seagate committed in 1999 to invest $29.6 million in a new manufacturing facility. Um, they asked for a $4.6 million economic development TIF to assist in the purchase of the land. The site had some soil issues, so soil improvements, um, do some road improvements. The city collected $34,041 in actual taxes, uh, city taxes during the TIF period, which was um, about nine years. Seagate collect, uh, collected approximately $5 million in TIF. The thing we did find out today is they actually didn't collect the $5 million in TIF. They actually took a bank note out, and it was a pay-as-you-go TIF. And there was a change in the early 2000s by the state on how commercial property was taxed, and it lowered their tax, taxes significantly. So at the end of the day, when this was decertified after the nine-year period, they were still about $3 million short. So it still got built, but it just shows as pay-as-you-go puts the taxpayer basically at risk. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I think that's when the state changed from a mill rate to a, a tax rate around that time, I'm not sure, but that could be. Are we gonna ask questions during this or should we save them up till afterward? Well, that's up to us. I mean, uh, we can ask questions as, you know, that are pertinent to the slides that we're showing. Okay. Um, you know, some of this here is a, a history lesson on, on uh, 
uh, TIF aspect. Mr. Reynolds? And, and as a reminder to, to all council members, this is a workshop. It's designed to be less formal than a normal council meeting uh, to allow that kind of interaction. So I would certainly encourage that if you have questions at any point, uh, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll find the answers. We can do that. Um, Mayor and Council, so uh, our finance director actually just handed me the spreadsheet on Seagate. So that was TIF number 11. The, it started out with a balance of uh, at 7% interest because this was back in the 90s, interest rates were higher. They didn't actually get their first payment until June, uh, they made their first payment in June of 2000. And I believe, excuse me, um, Councilmember Lehman is correct. So in 2001, their taxes were $449,064. Um, and that was, so it's over $800,000 a year. It changed to um, just under $269,000. So there was a significant drop for the money that they were paying into the TIF. Okay, and that created a shortfall? They ended up uh, collecting $3.6 million and they were short $2.875 million. And that was on them? Yes. Uh, question so far. So the because we set this, this was set up to spur development. Then they changed the taxes at the state level, but the city wasn't at risk. Is that correct, Mayor and Council? That's correct. So most of our um, what I'll call newer tiffs that are in the 90s are all pay as you go. Yeah. Thank you. So Other the, questions? The risk goes on to whoever the applicant. Okay. Was. Go ahead. So this was Seagate in 2017. Um, so they had 800 high paying, high tech jobs. So one of the big changes is this originally started out as a manufacturing facility. It's now a research and development facility. So they went from manufacturing jobs here. Um, this is their current employment. They did have a layoff, um, I believe it was late last year. So they currently have 800 jobs there. Uh, it's a research and development hub for Seagate. The other facilities they have, there's one in Colorado and there's one in Bangalore, India. So this is a pretty significant facility for them in the world. The city now collects $114,000 in city taxes. The total taxes they pay is $821,784. And it currently shows that it has a market value of $22 million. So just, uh, we were talking about previous taxes in 2000 or whenever that change was at the state and those taxes were up around 800,000 then they came back down created that shortfall but then years later the taxes are back up around 800,000 is that correct mayor and council that's correct so there's been kind of a swing back to right. the number that it was in about 2000 okay. so i think our point was with no seagate there it's the but for clause that's required in tiff the taxes would have been over the same time period that 24,000 and we would have collected about $6,000 of that. So a pretty significant impact. So we took a short term hiatus on the taxes, but it's come back. We're now collecting pretty significant taxes and have 800 high paying jobs and basically a pretty significant corporate pre corporate <coughs> presence for Seagate. So the TIF basics, it's self-financing. So the recipient pays their full taxes that are used to support the specific activity. It's a pay-as-you-go program, so there really is no risk to the city. There's a fixed term for that capture, and then that new development is added back into the tax base. So where does the TIF come from? So the recipient actually pays their full property tax that's due to the county. The county then cuts a check, uh, less their fees, back to the city, and then the city pays its negotiated percentage to the recipient. Typically happens twice a year. If no payments made to the county and no payments made to the recipient, Typically, they're now in default of a TIF agreement, and most of our agreements have a cure period. So if some, it was a mistake or whatever, the whole agreement doesn't collapse. But basically, if they did not make their pay next payment is in the agreement, it, the TIF district would be decertified, and all of it would go back on the tax rolls. So that's where another point here, that last bullet point. Uh, if the development fails and they default, the city's not at risk, it just goes back to full taxation, is that correct? Or full allotted directly to the city and... Correct, Mayor and Council. And so one of the things that other cities are doing, or we would recommend doing, if it's for infrastructure, 
we would ask the developer to post a letter of credit to ensure that infrastructure gets built. Yeah. Um, because if they do default and they're in the middle of construction or something, we would still have the funds available to us as a city to finish that roadway or whatever it was. Yeah. Through any. And at, through the life of the TIF for Seagate in this example, how much did this project cost the taxpayers of Shakopee? Nothing. I mean, right. there was no money out of pocket. I mean, the city still collected the original increment on the, the bare land. Right. And we can, as we get further into this, we can ask Mr. Dunaway, there's been some question of how the school districts are handled because they're a big chunk of the tax bill. And the state has had some discussion on how they make that up through their payments to the district. So when the city decides that for any TIF district that we're going to go ahead with a TIF district, the county and the school district is an automatic, they put their portion into that TIF district. But you said the, the state actually kicks back to the schools. It, Mr. Dunaway can describe okay. kind of, it's not a dollar for dollar, but they do take the TIFs into consideration when they're funding the state share of the school districts. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lewis? Yeah, you were saying that uh, Seagate pays 821000 The normal breakdown is uh, third to the county, the school, and us. That would be about 275, and we're only collecting 114. Where's the discrepancy coming? The, the Council, Council Member Mayor, there, there's no discrepancy. The difference is commercial property pays fiscal disparities, which the city does not get. That goes to the state. And there's also a state commercial tax that the city and the county do not get, so those are deducted out. And particularly on these large commercial properties, those are pretty significant payments. Those are still made during the TIF period. The only thing that goes into that TIF pot is the um, local taxing districts. So the school district, the city, the county, the mosquito district, any of the local taxing districts, the state still gets the fiscal disparities paid in and still gets the state commercial real estate. We do recover um, typically about two thirds of the fiscal disparity. So that money is still coming back to the city kind of the way the state does their allocations. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, now, when, when, a, when a company comes in and wants a TIF district, we have fees associated with doing the paperwork, isn't it? And I don't recall those fees. I don't know if the, I don't want to catch you off. Mayor and Council, it's about $12,000 plus um, any special services we have to hire on top of that. So that, that pays for all of our work that we do to put this yes. paperwork together. Any other, uh, go ahead, continue. So these are the uh, types of TIF districts allowed by the state of Minnesota. So there's a redevelopment uh, district, which is either heavily blighted and concentrated development of 70%. That maximum term allowed is 25 years. There's a renewal and renovation district, which is a lighter blight, lighter blight concentration, and that's 15 years. There's a housing uh, TIF district for low and moderate income <coughs> housing of 25 years. There's a soil condition uh, where you have contaminated soils or issues with the soils, which is 20 years. And there's the economic development TIF for manufacturing, which is eight years, which you'll see we've used significantly um, in Shakopee. So the first TIF district was created pre-1979 for Kmart uh, out in the West End. There have been 16 other districts created since, including a senior high rise, uh, in, that was a redevelopment, and that was decertified in 1994. That's on um, Bluff. There was a motel uh, redevelopment, which was decertified in 1997. MEBCO, which is uh, still around in a different version, was an economic development TIF, decertified in 1998. FMG, which then became Imagine Print Solutions, had an economic development TIF which is also decertified in 1999. And again, Seagate Economic Development decertified in 2007. So well, what can the tip- I have a question, Michael, yes, I'm sir. sorry. Back on the last slide, that FMG was a, were they a predecessor to Imagine, uh, Imagine Print? No, my wife, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, they were actually a company out of uh, Japan that made potpourri and things. Yes. And, uh, than Belay Industries. Yeah, I'm very familiar with this company, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Were they a predecessor and then Imagine Print took over their Imagine building? Imagine Print, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they were okay. not of not well, Imagine Print, but they were they were owner of that building. Right, right. okay. Sorry. Mayor, there's actually been three different companies in that right. building. The, yes, sir, I put that been. on so we'd all 
the public would know today which building we're talking about. Today okay. it is Imagine Print Solutions. Right. On the same slide, uh, you mentioned Kmart. Was that the, re the retail establishment uh, or was that the warehouse? It was the, war uh, the distribution center, not the retail? Yep. Okay. Which is now uh, General Warehouse and Polaris and a couple Polaris, other companies yeah. have okay. stuff stored. You said West End, so I... I yep, sorry. Yeah. Uh, question? Councilor Luce? Just for, uh, to make things straight here, it isn't Bluff Avenue that the senior high rise is on, it's Levy Drive, just so everybody uh, knows. Sorry, you're right. Levy Drive. Okay. Thank you. Continue. So what can TIF funds be used for? So public improvements, land acquisition, soil correction, site preparation and demolition, relocation, financing fees and capitalized interest, and the city typically gets a 10% administrative cost. We have some TIFs that are not at the 10%, they're less, but 10% is the maximum allowed by state law. Uh, public improvement costs. Why wouldn't we take the maximum allowed? That was a council, mayor and council, that was a council decision on the RAR TIF that you gave them, I believe, 97, 98, 97%. 97% on? RAR? Yes. So we're keeping 3% of that right. TIF. And the benefit of that 10% is in districts you're allowed to do what's called TIF pooling. So on RAR, let's say it was the 10%, that money could have gone into surrounding properties um, that the EDA and City <coughs> Council would agree to. Councilor Lehman? I thought the uh, sunset in the state statute on pooling expired December of 2016. Be a question for the next gentleman. No sunset on the pooling. Uh, I'm sorry. You want to come forward and our representative from Springstead, welcome. Hi, thank you. Tom Denley with Springstead Incorporated, uh, city's public financial advisory firm. Uh, there have been some some recent uh, modifications and language changes to some of the pooling authority, but the pooling authority is still present. There was a period of time, so um, districts are, there's a, what's known as the five-year rule with the TIF district. So over the first five years of a TIF district, they're able to, the city is able to enter into new development agreements, new pay-as-you-go agreements, those types of obligations during the first five years of a TIF district. After that five years, everything that's considered to be spent by the TIF, di TIF district is part of its pooling authority. And it's either inside or outside the TIF district, and that's limited to either 20 or 25 percent based off the type of TIF district. There were some provisions during a number of years, you know, from 07 through I think 2012, there was a period of time where certain districts created within that period had an extended period of that five-year rule. That five-year rule became a nine-year rule in certain cases and that was to help fund projects that were created during the recession and help to provide some additional flexibility in that during that era. So maybe that was what the council member was thinking about. Uh, there's been some additional clarification as to how pooling is determined as an annual test as opposed to a cumulative over the life of the district that's been recently clarify, clarified by the state auditor and within the, the legislation as well. But there's been no, no definitive sunsetting of the pooling clause okay. per se. Excellent, thank you. Other questions at this point? Otherwise, continue, Michael. And, and Mayor and Council, uh, one of the points that uh, Mr. Dunaway just <coughs> made is and any of these districts, whether it's Seagate, the reason why their district was delayed, that was a big project and it took them two years. <coughs> the uh, recipient of a TIF district only has that five years to get the project done. After that, any other money they spend goes back on full taxation. So when you see, it, for instance, a redevelopment district, the 25 years, they don't have 25 years to complete the task. They have five years to complete the task. To bring it up to value? Yes. Okay. <coughs> So public improvement costs that are not allowed, public buildings such as City Hall, public safety, public works buildings, culture and recreation such as parks, community centers, golf courses, et cetera, and administration beyond the 10% of the TIF collections. Can, can oh, you back, yep. can back up just one to soft costs related to any of the above? What, are, what exactly does that mean? Sidewalks and walkways <coughs> and bridges and streets, so, what's the soft cost? 
That would be engineering fees, um, landscape architecture fees. fees, whatever you had to do to generate streets and roads, utilities, bridges, parking, sidewalks and walkways. So if we had to hire a firm to design some of that, that could be included in the... If I, <coughs> like, <coughs> excuse me, engineering costs for a roadway, but like design costs as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Are they exclusive <coughs> to local or if they're state or federal requirements? that project is a bridge over 494 and it takes federal authorizations and it costs a permitting fee to the federal government, that's a soft cost eligible? Well, I think that's within Thank you. Part of the project. I think it's more for cost that would, thank you for the question, I think it would be more specific to cost that are being directly incurred by the city if it's related to a public improvement and the design elements of that public improvement. Um, if the city has had, had to make a required contribution as part of a public improvement project that had federal funding, the city's contribution of that project could be considered an eligible improvement and the entirety of that, that, that contribution would be eligible. As a soft cost. As a, well, it'd be, it, would, it would all get wrapped into the, the public improvement costs, yes. That good clar clarification, Councilor? I think so. Okay. All right. Other questions? Otherwise, continue. So we thought we'd just go over the active TIFs currently we have in Shakopee. So River City Center is a 25-year redevelopment TIF of just over $2 million, comes due in 2024, created 52 units of CDA-owned senior housing, commercial and retail at the street level. The payment's about $70,000 a year, and the city still controls the land there. Um, Sanmar is an eight-year economic development TIF of $2 million at a 5% uh, interest. Comes due in 2022. <coughs> was used to attract the company here, added 150 full-time jobs, 117 jobs at wages no less than $12 an hour and 33 jobs at no less than $16.60 an hour. Investment and a new taxable market value of $25.6 million. So their annual uh, payment now is $284,385 based on that 90% because we're keeping 10% of that increase. Keep 10% on San Mar, okay. All Saints Senior Living, that's a 25-year affordable housing TIF of a million dollars, um, comes due in 2039, but based on the taxes they're paying, it's likely to be paid off by 2026. Um, created senior housing community with 17 units subsidized, an investment of approximately $12 million. The annual payment's $138,000 based on that 90% of the generated TIF revenue. A question on this, just to, for clarification. So you issue TIF to a dollar amount, and then if the captured increment over time exceeds that amount, then the TIF is over, like on this All Saints um, TIF of a million dollars, but you're gonna pay it off early by 10 plus years. So does that mean that it's the value and the taxation is higher than originally estimated, and so they're gonna max out the TIF? Mayor and Council, that's correct. So what typically happens is Springstead or their consultant do a run of numbers yeah. that shows an interest rate. I mean, that's one of the things you'll see on some of the earlier ones, the interest rate's pretty high. That's because they don't want that to happen because yeah. they're taking a note to a bank at six or 7%, and so our TIF payment basically goes to that bank to pay off that note because they have yeah. to borrow that money somehow. Mm -hmm. um, on this one, because of changes in taxes and valuation, it's going to pay off surly, and so that will be decertified when it hits the million dollars. And and just add a little bit of additional information. When this district was created, uh, the, the pay go amount was sized around a million dollars, and it was intended to pay off early. The TIF plan has authority to remain open. That being said, under TIF law, once the outstanding obligation of the district's paid off, that district is now required to be decertified. So once right. that million dollar pay goes paid off, the district has to be decertified. Yeah. Value comes back on the tax rolls. But the time this was created, it was known that it was not gonna take the full term of the district, that it was gonna be paid off early. And I believe this one was also uh, a straight pay, or, no, it was the RAR that doesn't have an interest rate. It was this one, this one was at a million dollars, but it was intended to be paid early. Okay. Councilor Lehman. So where does, where does the pooling dollars come from? If you're 
reaching that threshold of the million dollars and then decertifying the district, how do you actually get this clean fund? And that's a a part of a negotiated agreement with the developer. Uh, if you were to make a PAYGO payment or enter into a PAYGO agreement based off of a less than 90% uh, repayment percentage, that's where that additional pooling dollars would come from. So the city could retain, you know, the city has the obligate, the ability to enter into whatever agreement that they can come, come up with or wish to enter into, and that agreement could be at a lower percentage rate than, say, 90% in this case. This could have been an 80% pay-as-you-go note, and then that 20% would be retained for potential pooling op opportunities. Dr. Lehman. Could that 20% be used for city services that are required for the site? Uh, no, not uh, that is not an eligible use of, of tax increment dollars. But once decertification happens, if they the value rises so much and the increment is captured and paid and pays off the fixed amount, then it comes back to decertification, fully taxed, then you're generating back, uh, back to the city, correct? Correct, and I, I think when we get to the yep. Amazon slide, they actually did not, um, a certain percentage of the value of that building went on the tax rolls at full value. Okay, mm -hmm. that is we'll get there. Councilor Lewis. Yeah, I just uh, think for the public that's listening, we need to let them know what decertification means. Okay. So a little better explanation on decertification and usually happens <laughs> at, at two different times, but Yes, uh, decertification, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Decertification is the term that's referred to when a TIF district is ended. Uh, it's either reached its maximum statutory term of, say, 25 years, depending on the type of district it is, or if it's paid off its outstanding obligation. Prior to that, uh, it's obligated, the city is obligated by state statute to decertify the district, which basically means to close the district, turn it off, put that property back on the general tax rolls, and allow everybody to benefit. So either you go to term or because of value, it maxes out early and they, the, up to the a dollar amount of the TIF and then once that's over, then it gets decertified, decertified again and uh, uh, goes back, uh, back to normal. And, uh, and, and there are th some stories here in Chalkby where that value is, has and this is a really, early. This is a good example, Mayor. Right. They, they will definitely yeah. decertif be decertified early. And you'll notice almost all of these are going to be decertified either because of time or dollar value between 2022 and 2025, 26. So there'll be no more TIFs. Other questions? Otherwise, continue. So this is uh, RAR. This is an eight year economic development TIF of 1.8 million with no interest, comes due in 2025. Retain the company, generate a 28 full-time jobs at 14.50 an hour, investment in new taxable market value of approximately 14 million dollars. The estimated 2018 annual payments 209,770 dollars, based on that 97 percent of generated TIF revenue. So this is, we'll call it a rare one, where they're getting more of the TIF. We didn't retain our 10 percent. This is uh, the 10 percent. Councilor Layman asked about this earlier. That normally 10 percent, but uh, RAR, we, we kept three. Okay. Councilor Lewis? Um, Mr. Kursky noted that this is a rare one. Yeah, this is a rare one because RAR has been the perfect um, company to work with for the city. I mean, they're always there when we need something. So this is one where we gave because they're always giving. Uh, other questions, comments? Continue. So this is the Amazon Fulfillment Center. It's an eight-year economic development TIF of $5.7 million, investment in new taxable market value of approximately $55 million, created 2,000 jobs, comes due in 2025. So by statute, the county, um, if they don't have a project in their current uh, capital improvement program, they can tap in first to the TIF money. So this is a good instance where that happened. And so, this TIF is strictly, is not, none of it goes to Amazon. They pay in, the money comes back to us, and it goes into strict public infrastructure. So there's $2.3 million that we got out of it, and county is taking it for Highway 83 improvements, so roughly $3.3 million. And this is one um, 
where 10 percent of the new market growth from the project was placed on the tax rolls and not captured as TIF. So the immediate growth in the tax base was $5.5 million. So this is one where there's two payments going on. They're paying on $5.5 million to the county and it's not in the TIF. And the differential are these two numbers that went into um, public road improvement. Councilor uh, Lehman. So the 10 percent of new market growth, we're, we're talking about the value going on to the tax capacity, not revenue. Correct. Uh, so the, ten, the, the captured tax capacity of the district, uh, instead of it being normally 100% of that incremental growth that's captured by TIF, in this case it was 90% of that. So that remaining 10% of the incremental growth is left as general tax base that provides immediate benefit to each of the taxing jurisdictions. And what is that benefit if it's not paying taxes? What was that? If it's not, if the, if the money, if the revenue is not going into the general fund to pay for services, what would that benefit be other than driving your, your tax rate down? Well, this is general tax base dollars, so it still comes into the tax base. If the city wanted to use that additional tax base to levy for additional dollars without impact, Im, impacting the tax rate, that's where that benefit could come in. But it, it, the, the additional 10%, in this case, the 5.5 million, that increased the city's overall tax base by 5.5 million. It didn't create actual dollars, it's, it, but it did create additional tax base with that levy dollars could be spread against. It's a part of the tax, right. the tax capacity, and then that's the, the overall value that we use to set our, uh, look at our levy and set our tax rate against. Right, and that lowers your rate because you're From spreading it out a lo larger right. dollar amount. For road improvements? Yeah. I can take all of it if I want. Okay. Uh, th this is an interesting one also. Um, so the county, if they choose and can prove they need it, they can take 100% of the TIF. So this is a negotiated, they're getting the 3.3 million to do um, 83, they're doing a concrete road, um, they improving the train crossing there over by Anchor Glass and doing concrete down to fourth. So that's what the 3.3 million went to. But technically they could have taken all of it if they could prove that there were other infrastructure needs in the area. Okay, culture Whiting. So you're saying even though that improvement is still kind of in the area of this, but it's really basically half a mile away, they're saying that because of this project, they needed that um, for that project, for the 83 improvements. So mayor and council, one of the things the counties have done, and this is unusual in Minnesota, they have access to basically the city's TIF to do um, roads that need maintenance. So going to a concrete section there is not, we did ours in asphalt, they made a decision to do theirs out of concrete because they didn't want to have to maintain asphalt. Right. So. Councilor uh, Malko. And on that same um, yes. question about the road improvements, do they have a time limit too? Yeah. From the county's yeah. perspective? Like the companies have that five year? Does the county to have- complete the To complete the identified? project that's identified? Yeah. Yeah, the county has the right to take, take the first TIF dollars if the project that's being proposed is causing the need for the road improvements. In this case, if, if the Amazon building was coming in and that was necessitating the, the need to improve that intersection and that roadway and that, that improvement was not within their capital improvement plan, then they have the right to take those dollars. But I don't know if there's any specific timeline within which they have to make those improvements, but I think they wouldn't, if they don't make those improvements immediately, they would have, they would, they would lack the right to take the, take the money would be my assumption. Uh, you know, if they can't, they can't claim dollars and then fail to make the improvement that they're claiming the dollars for. And Councilor Whiting? Does the county, if, if, say, the city didn't create a TIF district here, does the county have the right to come in and force a TIF district in this situation? Uh, no, they would not. Okay. Sure. Councilor Lamb? Well, I'm trying to figure out how the county or any other entity could build an improvement immediately when they, unless they fund it themselves. The, oh, they would? They'd have to fund it themselves. Well, that was part of, so I like this example about Amazon because I believe that the captured TIF, city, county, went to pay for uh, infrastructure, in this case roadways, around the facility or around the area. You said once that, well, it's because of the impact. So, yep. and we got 
Sarazen, 4th Avenue, and we're getting the over by Anchor Glass done. And the impact for Amazon, but the impact actually for the surrounding area has been there. Uh, Certainty, to Sanmar, 4th Avenue was deteriorating on a daily basis, as all of us are aware of. My question is, if this wouldn't have happened, and we wanted that improvement, I'm looking at $5.6 million worth of roadway improvements. Um, what type of impact would that have had on taxation, both for the city or the county? Well, Councilor Lehman. I'll get back to my original question. My, my original question is this, if there's $6 million worth of road improvements on the Amazon project, roughly, where did the six million come from? It's not like they paid, it's not like Amazon just paid six million dollars in taxes in one shot and then we took that money and built these roads. Somebody had to put the money up somewhere yep. and get reimbursed after the fact. And the captured TIF is the reimbursement part so, of it. So, so a company could go to a bank and use the TIF as, as their payment, but what about uh, the county or the city? Well, the, as Michael said earlier, this, these two numbers here, 2.3 and 3.3, were negotiated. So, so we, we would take it from one of our funds and pay back that right. fund. So, so either, either the city, county, whatever entity that's going to build the, the roads is yep. going to bond for it and pay back the bonds out of the TIF dollars, or the developer is going to put up a letter, a letter credit. of credit that you're going to... Yeah draw down on if the TIF doesn't come forward to make the payments on the bonds, right? Is that typically how it's done? Thank you, Darren. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lehman, I didn't catch that last part, but uh, the reimbursement piece of that, if it's in-house, um, with the Amazon piece, we were just, we funded that in with our reserves, basically, through the Capital Improvement Fund. And so now we're repaying that as the increment comes in on a semi-annual basis, we're replenishing that fund. If you remember, it was earlier this summer we did that transfer to yeah. transfer from the Amazon TIF because yeah. we had finally now just created that Amazon TIF yeah. to replenish the, the capital improvement right. fund. And now that fund is negative, but it's gonna get replenished as the increment comes in now over the next eight and a half years. Yeah, Darren, to your point and to Mr. Lavin's comment, there's th three Make primary- sure you're speaking into the microphone. There's there. three primary funding mechanisms for for funding that project up front. Either a developer on a pay-as-you-go basis where the developer makes an, you know, takes out an obligation and they get reimbursed. The second is you know the city could issue debt and use that future TIF revenue to repay that debt and they could have additional security for that based off a letter of credit. And the third case is that the city can do what's called an interfund loan. So they can use reserves from an existing fund and then use future TIF dollars to repay themselves for those costs. And they can they can accrue an interest component on that as well to repay themselves those dollars plus interest for the loss of the use of those funds. Whether we fund it internally and get paid by TIF, or we bond for it mm -hmm. and get paid by TIF. Yep. Either those way. are yeah. So those would be the two methods that a city would fund a project right. up front using TIF dollars. Right. Councilors, are we getting interest from Amazon on that TIF that we took out of our funds? I I, I don't recall if we. Do uh, Council Member Luce, um, I think because the admin piece is it's only like point. Most of the time, it's like the ten percent that we've been talking about. Yeah. On this one, it's it was negotiated at like point three percent. So our admin dollars are so small, but well, the interest component, I don't. This would be on the interfund loan principle, and I would oh, have to. Oh sure, yeah. So I the interfund loan principle probably, and I'd have to double check the resolution. Uh, probably does have an interest component to it. I, uh, it I think it does. 2.2? So, what was that? Are you saying 2.2? No, it, it probably has an interest component to it. Oh. Uh, what the interest rate would be, I don't know off the top of my head. It is set by statute to be based off a of prime. I right, I, right now, I believe the max is about 4%. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we do have a, there is interest in that. No, I believe recall. there is. Is that a negotiated rate or is that set by the state? Uh, it's a state stat, state. The, yeah, the state sets a max, and it's the city's decision as to what they want, right. and it's the city borrowing against itself. So if they want to pay themselves back at, at interest, when you adopt the interfund loan as the city council, you can determine what that interest rate would be from 0% up to whatever the cap is based off a of statute. I think right now the cap is at 4%. And a 4% interest rate for the city's investments is 
we take that every day of the week because mm -hmm. our normal investments are only earning you know one and a half at the most type deal so right but i would just like yeah. to make sure we're getting our one and a half so that we're not funding this in a negative mm -hmm. right absolutely other comments discussion here there's pretty good discussion here um about the impact and then uh <coughs> the i feel a, a public improvement that uh in this case is uh benefiting the community and certainly benefiting that industrial area um I've watched Fourth Avenue for a long time, and we've done it in sections. But that critical section, I think, from Sarazen to the east, was the the last hunk of it. That um, you know, and that was in tough shape. You, you mentioned a few of the businesses, but we also got some new the Duke projects down there that that built up. So that also added, or we didn't have to create that improvement, but we got the benefit from it. Councilor Lehman. That stretch of road was one of the oldest roads in Shakopee. The so what? That was one of the oldest roads in Shakopee, so whoever built it to begin with did a good job. <laughs> well, we got, did we get 25 years out of it? We or? got much more than it's 25 probably right out on of bedrock. It. <laughs> it was like pre-58 or something like that. Right. But I know that, like, you know, not that, uh, I just feel it's a big industrial with a lot of semis on it. I know the impact of, you know, Certainty was using the shoulder for a long time until they finally bought that farm and put a parking lot in there. Um, you know, they, they um, so to me, I look at it as a, as a public benefit to, to get that last segment done. I, actually, the I county would, aspect is a benefit. I would say that Fourth Avenue lasted so long because going back to the 50s when, when it was built or even prior, because it, it predates the records. Right. But the uses that were on that road weren't the same uses that are there uh, today. Today, right. Okay, there was farmer's fields and maybe mm -hmm. a tractor or something like that or horse and buggy or whatever. But once we started introducing all the semis to that right. area, they take a toll on the roads. I don't see that. And that's why you have Scott County wanting to put the concrete on. And we kind of talked about that, too. That's where all the semis are parked on 4th, making the turns. Sitting, sitting. Making the turns on 83, and all the weight of turning the steering wheels when stopped is hard on hot asphalt in the 90, 100 degree day. Okay. Um, good discussion. Uh, more questions, at least on this example. Continue. So this is um, something we've talked about, but we thought we'd get a bit more specific. So this is the Canterbury area. The two highlighted blue circles are two public infrastructure projects. The larger oval is actually in the comprehensive plan as a roadway connection. Um, that was approved in the comprehensive plan. The other circle is an area where the county has received federal funding, and there's a requirement for the city to participate in that to acquire additional, additional right of way on um, 83 to widen the road, and also they're planning on doing a concrete section in that area. So the city will have some ask by the county when that project comes forward, which I believe is in 2020. So, um, Councilor, just one minute here, Councilor Lehman. The uh, the ask that we have in our our CIP for 2020 is one million for the city, three million in a form of a Scott County and a federal grant, and that's specifically for 12th Avenue and 83. And I didn't find the other area, which is marked on here, is eight. I didn't find that in our comprehensive plan, at least not the CIP. The, the CIP. I didn't I didn't see it on the CIP, at least not the city's online version i didn't look at my paper copy mayor and council just it's in the comprehensive plan which is 2030 right now so again that's a pretty long window no, okay the, i think he's talking he said that i understand the comp plan but it's not in the cip right and i and then and then i have a follow-on it's really hard to tell in this circle number eight what exactly that road is and where it starts and where it ends part of that is an existing road 12th avenue um does it end at the little stub by the uh, power plant new power plant that goes out to 16 yes, sir. Uh, eagle creek okay so it doesn't go all the way over to 83 correct okay so that was a council through these are all before my time so i apologize but we did take right away to do a straight shot down which would be 
different than what's in the current comprehensive plan and approved. And we vacated that right away, I believe, that in July. The one that goes straight down. No, 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 we retained no. it. I that that right away, I do not believe that has been, a, a, so right away has not been line? abandoned yet. Was that down a drainage ditch? I thought we did. But are you you're talking about right by the, the Howard Farm? Yeah. Mr. Reynolds. The back of the houses. Uh, yeah, if you'll, if you'll recall uh, discussions uh, about a year and a half ago when that was first brought forward, uh, it was specifically we had some concern from some of the, the residents actually in that area. and. Uh, uh, but uh, Mr. Sampson and his uh, people were able to work out uh, the agreement and it came before council and was passed. Uh, it has not been vacated. So what did we pass? Copy plan, I thought. The realignment? Correct. Okay. Because the, the original alignment is this curve that you see and essentially now we have a north-south straightaway. Right. The comp plan had the curve. What section of 12th Avenue did we vacate? I'm not sure any huh? section of 12th Avenue was vacated, sir. Okay, I'll go up to check my notes. We'll, 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 we'll go back and check on that, though. Mayor and Council, I believe there was a hearing set, but it was never brought forward. Okay. All right. Enough clarification, or we're going to get some more a little bit, but so Councilor Lehman? What portion of, of this road is private, and which portion is public? It would all be public. The, we only show public roads in the comprehensive plan. I think mm -hmm. there's been a council mandate to limit private roads. This would basically connect Shenandoah down to um, Eagle Creek. You're talking currently? Currently. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't believe when you all went through the replatting and the right of way got moved around, yeah. uh, if this gets replatted and another project comes into this area, their plan is to, to as council member Lehman suggested, abandon the right of way that was given a year and a half ago and rededicate the right of way in the location that's in the comprehensive plan. Isn't this road currently a private road today? You can, I, I, I believe you can drive right through Canterbury's parking lot. Well, everybody does, doesn't mean it's a public road. Huh? And Mayor and Council, the other thing is we do have a CIP project in the current CIP to build either a signalized intersection or a um, roundabout at the intersection mm -hmm. um, where Veerling comes in and across there. Okay. You're talking More Veerling questions? and 16. Yeah. Veerling and 16. You're not talking, would be 12, is that 12th Avenue, right? Past. Uh, 12th Avenue plant. is the one that goes east-west yeah. yeah. from 83. But you're McDonald's, talking the Veerling and, and 12th and then Right towards so the towards the, the west. I the guess. roundabout right. would be right right around here. Yeah. Yep. The where Veerling comes down, next to the power plant. Yep. Next to the power plant, right on Eagle Creek. And I believe engineering has got a study underway to see right. what the best solution because we've had some conversations with the fire department and other users in the area. That's a pretty high speed road. Mm -hmm. um, which was interesting. I, I drive that a lot, and no one, very rarely do people hit the 50 mile an hour because there's a flashing sign. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're engineers currently studying what the best solution is for that intersection. All right, Councilor Lehman. The version of the Shenandoah extended that I saw recently has got like five roundabouts and ten, roughly 10 blocks. Um, is that still the design for this road? I mean, that's, that seems like a lot of roundabouts. How many? Short. Five. If, Mayor, you, if Mayor, you count 16. Mayor and Council, I believe the three. roundabouts, one of the issues with the straight shot road is that tractor trailers can come down through that area. Mm -hmm. And when the Planning Commission looked at this conceptual <laughs> plan, there was actually a lot of people from the neighborhood, particularly up in. Uh, We've heard word. from those people before. Come on. Well, if it's a public road, I mean, it's a public road, like any other road. They well, should be able, it's they, a city road, right? And for transportation, we're trying to discourage, and you're right, public road, but you're trying to discourage that you'd want someone from Amazon to go out that way and access Eagle Creek or 83. You'd want them to take new and improved 4th Avenue, new and improved 83 and go south, or 
you could go out on 101 and go north or, or east on 13. Well, I'm looking at it from a, a cost standpoint. You're, you're adding a substantial cost, putting all these roundabouts in with art and sculptures and plantings and everything else, when is that the, the best use of, of the money? You know, and if, if you, if you want to limit the traffic on it, um, post it, no trucks, and put a weight limit on it or, or make it a private road. You know, there's a lot of options here. And Mayor and Council, the, the added sculpture and all that stuff would not be covered by the TIF. If you remember, go back, TIF's basically going to pay for the roadway improvements, <laughs> the sidewalks, things like that, but it would not pay for things in the roundabout like sculpture. But it would cover it? By statute. By statute. Would it cover the roundabouts? Yes. Councilor Moko? I think the other thing for me that roundabouts do is they slow traffic down, and it's not taking it at the maximum speed either. So you can look at it that way as well. That's a lot in a short space. Okay. Um, more or less? So in Canterbury, it would build a $6 million road that's shown in the comprehensive plan connecting the community. It would contribute the city's portion of the county's improvements to Highway 83 in 2020. So it's interesting, um, the county's not showing the full value of those improvements because if they do, they cannot ask for the TIF money. So while the county is currently showing a million dollar contribution from the city, the number will be larger and, and actually as part of the EAW that Canterbury, for the apartments that was done, the county sent us a letter that said they will ask for a significant amount of the TIF dollars because the 83 improvements are far and above what their original estimate was because they're going to have to require a lot of right of way through that area. So they have not purposely put it in because they know at some point we may do a TIF and once they do that, they cannot take it from the TIF. Without the TIF, the 20 year bonding on these requirements would add approximately $44 to a single family home and increase the tax rate roughly from 37.4 to 39.4. Councilor Lehman. So, I'm trying to understand how we come to this conclusion because if you, let, let's say you bonded $6 million for a road improvement, over 20 years is 300,000 a year. Our current 2018 budget, we increased the levy by 500,000 and then told the taxpayers there'd be no increase because of new growth and tax capacity increases. So 500,000 has no tax impact, but 300,000 is the end of the world. So, so we used a number because we know what the county has proposed for 83 and included the roundabout that's currently in the CIP. So that totals about $10 million. And Darren can answer, he ran these numbers of how we came up with the $44. This, ha this has some money for the county too? Yes, sir. And then, so that's factored in. So the, 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 the exercise here is the, you capture a TIF to help for pay for the public improvements. If you don't do that, then you bond for them, and then that could be a tax increase. Well, and, and let's just think through this a little bit. So if you bond for the improvement, you start out by saying, okay, this improvement in five years is going to pay for this, this TIF in five years is going to pay for this improvement with the value, added value, right? If uh, the rough numbers, but that's only for one part of it. The six million. Yep. Okay. So we're saying that the added value of the project is going to pay for the six million in five years. If you bonded for it, would not that added value still give you money to use toward that bond payment? Uh, but you'd be asking all the citizens of Shakopee to pay for that bond payment rather than the actual project. No, no I'm saying if the TIF district can create enough mm -hmm. value in five years to pay off that $6 million, if you bonded for the $6 million, you still get the value from the project. You still have. That, that money could then go and pay the bonds. Well, but I, if I may, the. And, 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 and Councilor Whiting is correct, as opposed to identifying a block area that will be solely responsible for funding that TIF, it is spread across the whole of the city. So 
it is not just that one small area that's paying for the road. It's all of the citizens of the city as a whole that would be paying for but it. But under a TIF, it is one area, is it not? So it is, but if you don't have the TIF, then it's all of the citizens that will be paying for it. But wouldn't you capture 100% of the value no. of that project? No. Uh, Michael? Mayor and Council, I think the issue here is so that was a $100 million project. It pays off. So they would have to go out and finance that road themselves. They did not ask for us to pay. They just wanted to go through a TIF district. So 100% on residential, there is no um, business costs that go to the city. There's no fiscal disparity. So it's a pretty big number on residential that goes back into the TIF. And it's 100% of the taxes, not just the city's portion, but everyone's portion. So it pays that road off in about seven years um, based on their net present value calculation. Because it's a hundred percent due to the classification of the of the development. It's yeah, c correct, and it's also due to the fact that the TIF district captures local t all of the local taxes, including right. the city, the county, and the s city, and the, or the city, the county, and the school district. If if a t you know if you were to capture the new value outside of a TIF district, it would take a significantly longer period to repay. That, that outstanding debt because you'd be doing it with a, with a smaller amount of revenue. Councilor Lewis? Yeah, but in this one, you're talking that the county's gonna come in and take a major portion, and we don't know that yet. Well, we know that. They, 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 they specifically have said that that's going to occur. It would very much be like, like, I think, like Amazon then. They wanted a piece in for their 83. We got a piece for Fourth Avenue and, and Sarazen, or uh, Shenandoah. And you know it's a it's a, a I don't know a partnership between you know the last time we discussed a part of this development it was talking about impact and in, in roadways and here's the aspect that if Canterbury comes forward with a TIF request that <coughs> the increment can capture and build out or upgrade or enhance that public infrastructure and use that increment. Uh, Whiting. You know, when they uh, did their half cent sales tax and they picked out projects throughout the whole county that they were going to work on, I asked the county why they didn't, because they, they've been talking about improving 83, and I asked them why they didn't pick out that project. Well, the reason was is they knew that Canterbury had a plan to do some development over there, and they were just waiting for that to happen so that they could get capture that money from that project rather than use it on their other projects so they've they've known that this was coming for a while we all have and uh that's why they did it that way do we happen to have these slides no sir we just sent those out as a yeah, way we can put them up uh, i think some um, no there's no way i'm nate shaking his head right now should find our <laughs> document yeah. camera spot how do we do that Eight and a half million dollars, and we can't put a thing on a TV screen. You can't get a clock. <laughs> oh, True. Okay. Huh? We could probably figure it out. We can pull up the PDF. Put on the, yeah, put on the doc can cam. Put on the doc cam. Councilman, what page are you looking for? Uh, it's them charts that were. Uh, I don't have page numbers. The, the Dumfries chart. Walk through those three examples. Yeah. Okay. In the middle of the table. You see the red dot. Yeah, I got it. Okay. You just Mayor and council members, if I if I could add um, to that that uh, Scott County project on 83 and 12, um, that does have federal money designated um, in the regional plan, um, and there is a daylight on that money. Yes. It would it would only uh, that money is only available until 2021. Um, if that project's not started in 2021, that would be lost money. How many dollars are we talking? Um, I, th I think that was about five, five point five million, um, of federal funding for that improvement. For the county, for their portion. Yep. That, that's that's not the county's portion. That's actual federal funding, and then the city and county would make up the the Mo typical twenty percent okay. oh, local I, share. So the feds have a deal out there that. And that is for what know. improvements exactly? That is for the improvement of County Highway 83. It would be south of the project that is being constructed next year, um, south of Valley Industrial Boulevard, all the way to 169. 
think that included the 12th Avenue. I, I think Does they had an open house the ramps on that on one. On 169 or was it, talking about it would improvements? It's mostly um, turn lane improvements, pavement improvements um, between 169 and 12th Avenue. Councilor Lewis. Okay, you're talking five mil from the Fed. That's supposed to be 80% of the project. Uh, the city and the county have to match 20%. Uh, that's another mil. So we're talking that extent of road for six million, and we're talking this little short road that's going to cost us six million. Where's the? But but then, as Mr. Kursky in, indicated, since they did their original estimates and cost for that original project that they submitted federal funding for, they've now um, reevaluated the costs, and the costs have escalated up. So they are expecting it to cost more, um, more than they originally anticipated. Do you and that, that additional money would typically be a, a local share absorbed by the locals. Do you have a general idea of what that might be? I, I don't at this time, no. Okay. <coughs> it just seems like a lot of road on one end well, for six million and an it, awful little you bit. You know, it is, a, it is a lot of road, both for um, the extension of 12th Avenue and as well as the improvements to 83 and Eagle Creek, all the way up to step one to 83 and 12. And they're gonna start uh, also the over by Anchor Glass, and then they're gonna come in and, and in between. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna say that that's all really part of this in totality, but that's the whole idea is to upgrade 83 from 101 to Eagle Creek, and then um, a, a city's portion, and they've come forward and said in this area, they're gonna have an ask of cost, you know? We've heard that, do we know that number? No. I, and I just wanna point out that our share of the costs was part of this discussion with this, this road improvement through Shenandoah, and this TIP district that they've given us an example of here. Okay. So, Councilor Lehman. the uh, three charts, <coughs> the first one that they're showing is 1201-1, uh, example of a TIF where the value is declining in the blighted area. Um, I feel pretty confident that the value on this property that we're talking about is, is, has been e increasing, so it would probably be more like number two or number three, probably more like number two is my guess. Um, which which figure are you saying talking about? Uh, the first one, the second one, or the third one? The second one. Okay, I think this is for illustration purposes of right of all different factors here, and you it want is. to pick out this one here? Well, well, I don't believe that the value of the of the property has gone down, and and hmm. the first one would be a really blighted area where the values are diving. Okay, and I don't think that applies to this particular case. It might in other areas, but I just don't think it applies to this project. Might but not be declining, but it's certainly not improving in its current condition. I think the value has gone up, maybe not as much as fully developed, mm -hmm. but for the sake of these, you know, it's probably not the third one either. Uh, it's probably somewhere between the two, but at any rate, there's a value hijacked from other taxing jurisdictions and that's the, the piece that I wanna be more educated on okay. from these experts that are here. Okay. So great. If, they wanna, if they wanna speak to that portion of it, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I think you know, it's, it, it's difficult to discuss you know, what is a hypothetical example here and an understanding of, the, of, the, of what the future value of a property would be absent any any future development is, you know, obviously a great unknown, but generally speaking, when a TIF district, when a TIF district is created, there is a set, the, the tax value that's on, in place at that time is frozen at that rate or at that amount, and the incremental growth from that is captured as TIF. Uh, is that capturing some potential future inflationary value of that base value of the property as it is today? Probably inherently. That's probably not, not an untrue statement that you know, land, land typically appreciates in value. Uh, so inherently some of that value is gonna get captured by, as part of the incremental growth and it won't be of a benefit to the local taxing jurisdictions <laughs> as a result of the TIF district. 
the question is, is how much is that and how, how great is that impact is, you know, is going to be specific to development and unknown at this point in time. It's something that we could analyze and provide you a number with, uh, but it's going to probably be a, you know, a, f a relatively nominal amount. If you look at current inflationary, you know, land value inflationary trends, you could probably look at that and say, you know, maybe it's a couple percent a year. Um, but absent any future development, it's not, you know, it's not going to have that, that large value increase that a new development would bring. Sure. Councilor Luce? You said nominal amount. I mean, my definition and your definition may be greatly different. I'm just curious on what your definition of nominal is. I mean nominal and just in the sense that it's going to be inflationary. It's going to be uh, some you know, some inflationary trend that you can look at and you can probably look historically at what values trends have been in, in Scott County to see how, how land or commercial land has been changing and, you know, from, a, from, from an inflationary standpoint, but it's, it's going to be an, incre you know, an, an incremental change at, at that. Uh, Darren, or, yeah, go ahead. Councilor Luce. Go ahead, Councilor Luce. Um, I was just going to add on to that. If you're looking at just value as well, here we're looking at new growth. Um, if all properties, if everything stays the same and everything just increases in value, that doesn't benefit anybody from the, it doesn't benefit the city on any level because we're still levying the same dollar amount. Mm -hmm. We just lower the tax rate. It would still have the same impact to that taxpayer. They would just have a higher value property incrementally. It just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't increase or decrease their tax levy. It would just have a higher value property with a little bit lower tax rate. Talking about putting property in play here that can have the highest and best use. Councilor Luce? Yeah, I just want to go back to nominal again. Can you put a dollar amount or a percentage amount on it so that, you know, the rest of the people in the city can, can get a grasp of it? I mean, you know. Inflation, is that essentially what it is? That's essentially what, what yeah. would be so lost is the inflationary growth in that land sure. value. And yeah. I would have to go back and look at historical trends to see what that is. My guess is it's probably a couple percent historically you know, if you look at the last 10 years, it's probably negative on average, uh, given what happened, you know, from 2007 through 2012. Councilor Lehman. So if I'm understanding correctly, when you put a TIF district in place over a property, <clears throat> that TIF is, is able to capture the county and the school dollars. So in, in this case, the county would try to recapture them dollars back out of the district for improvements. Um, and then if, if you put the road in, well, since the road is now there and the services are there, the, the five lots that join up to that road, now their value of them lots is substantially being increased. So now they're actually accessible. They weren't accessible without the road there. And, and, and whatever would get built on those lots, well, in just, the five land, years. just the land value itself would be substantially higher because now it's actually buildable and accessible because it wasn't accessible because there's no road there. There's no, nothing fronting it so you couldn't get to it. So does the value increase of the parcels, are they part of that hijacked value or are they part of the value of the TIF or and then you have the actual construction of the building that happens on the lot later. And then where do these pieces fit within this puzzle? Yes, uh, good question. The incremental growth and value to those parcels due to them no longer being landlocked would create additional value that would create additional tax increment revenue. That being said, those TIF dollars that would be generated by that increased value is going to, going to be used to repay the cost of, of creating that road that allowed that value to go up in the first place. So there is going to be some level of increment that will be generated through increased land value due, the, due to these parcels having, having access, as you pointed out. But the, that, the benefit of that increased TIF dollars will go towards reimbursing the cost of providing that access. Okay, and the other piece of the question, the other taxing jurisdictions that don't get the benefit of that increased valuation on that lot, does that make their hijack? piece higher? Well, it, it all starts as to where you would draw the line. If all you right. draw the line yeah. as to what was, what level of growth in value was spurred by the public improvement that the TIF district was created to fund, 
I would consider that not, not to be hijacked dollars. I would consider the, you know, and I hate to use the term hijacked dollars, but I would consider that to be the inflationary I, growth absent any I improvement. I only use it because it's on Yeah, I understand. I definitely understand. You know, it, it's, it's funny what you just said. You said the, the increased value that the public improvement captured by the, that was funded by the TIF increased the value. Actually, that's the whole goal. The whole thing is to capture that incremental with some public improvement that you caption if you show chart number one, um, rather than trying to concentrate on, on the m more of a critical example. It's a more, it's a more realistic uh, example of the situation. I actually th think the other chart is that if you're, if you're gonna create a TIF district and capture the increment of, of, new of redevelopment or that, and there's public infrastructure that goes with it in roadways, yeah, the, the whole area. And then the TIF district, uh, all around it gets captured too. It's much like- I'm still trying to get an answer okay. to that question. Uh, would, would an example of uh, benefit uh, that's hijacked from other <coughs> taxing jurisdictions be if you did a, a TIF district on a commercial industrial property and the fiscal disparities portion is, is still taken out? We, we don't lose, that, that's not, we still got to pay that on that property. So would that be something that would be hijacked from other taxing jurisdictions? An example of that? I think in the sense of, of the value hijacked, it's really the, the inflationary growth that would have occurred on that property before any development. I would think of, you know, think of an eight after development and before development. If nothing happened on that site, but it was in a TIF district and some inflationary growth happened, yes, that value would have been you know, quote unquote, hijacked. But if any value is created that's resulting from development and from things that were funded by the TIF district, I wouldn't consider those to be hijacked dollars. I would consider that to be value created due to the TIF district and due to the development that the TIF, TIF district was created for. Let me, let me try it a different way. I want to understand that piece. Let's say you've got a lot that's not accessible and it's worth <coughs> 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. You put a road in front of it, now it's worth $20. Mm -hmm. The school portion of the tax at ten dollars is a dollar, and now the school's portion of the tax at twenty dollars is two dollars. Um, under the TIF, the city or the school loses the dollar, and when you increase <coughs> the valuation of the property, they now lose the two dollars because that they're 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 losing that tax if, under the TIF. In right. general, TIF dollars, anytime new TIF dollars are created and captured under, under a TIF district, I would say they, they lack the benefit from the, t the dollar tax dollars that were created by the TIF district. They don't benefit from the creation of that new market value and that new tax dollars that were created because that revenue is captured by the TIF district and redirected. Uh, but that being said, if that value of the land is increased due to some, you know, some public improvement that was created and funded by the TIF district, I think you know, you have kind of a chicken and an egg. That, that value would not have been created but for the use of the TIF. But for just one minute, just one, Mr. Reynolds. Yeah, and so essentially, so if, if the school is paying at this level and the TIF increases to this level, it's not, the school is not losing this. Right. Mm -hmm. They're just not gaining this. And let's not forget that the state under their, their, their aid formula takes into consideration uh, property value that increases through TIF and does make some adjustments for that. Yeah, yeah and I think this might okay. be a good time to jump into the, the school district explanation. Or, right. Well, I just wanna make one clarification because I, I think we're, we're using the word hijacked and not really thinking about what it's talking mm -hmm. about when it's where the original value was taxable and is automatically gonna go up anyway, but yet we're taking that TIF and that's where those dollars are then getting hijacked into the, the TIF district is what would have naturally occurred. Councilor Whiting. No, I think uh, Administrator Reynolds pointed it out that in your example, the one dollar the school district still gets, the second dollar they don't. So and that one dollar is then froze, so even if, you know, whatever market inflation and stuff, it's froze at that rate, correct? That, that, that is correct. Yeah. Until that's closed out. Yeah. yeah. Under the reference right. of market value. So Michael, or you got more? Yeah, so... So now let's go a little further. So we're two years into it, and we build a whole bunch of houses and a whole bunch of kids go to the schools. 
Now, the school's not getting anything off this property, so I'm trying to figure out how that benefits. Well, but if, if, if we're building houses, they are. They're getting the full value of any houses. They're not getting the value from uh, uh, the roadway. We're talking about the, the funding that's used to build the roadway. Right, but the housing would be in the TIF district, correct? So isn't the taxation of them houses going back into the TIF to pay down the The, the, the improvements are, correct. And that includes other jurisdictions. Yep. So the only value the school district would get is if there's a kids that live there that go to school and they would get the state per pupil. Per pupil. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Right? There's two or three primary mechanisms with, with which schools get funded. The, the, the largest being the per pupil cost that's funded by the state. So if a TIF district's created and there's a rental unit that's within that TIF district, and that does contain students, they would get additional revenue because of that student now being in the school district. Additionally, they get revenue through the referendum market value. Yeah. The referendum market value is not captured by TIF. Uh, so they would receive 100% of the new benefit from, this, from any TIF development that was created within a TIF district on the referendum market value standpoint. Referendum of uh, operating, ongoing? Anything that falls into that referendum market value category yeah. that's taxable value based, yeah. similar to the EDA levy, that same thing applies to school districts, and that's where the full they get value. And that and the full value. So 100% of the market value growth that's resulting from this project gets added to that referendum market value and adds to their tax base in that regard. Okay. They do not benefit from the increased tax capacity as a result of this of this rental unit being within the TIF district. Right. That being said, city or school districts are funded, so the formula states that they have to, you know, there's a whole formula that goes in and then it tells the school district how much they have to levy at the end of the year based on the formula. And that formula then gets spread against their tax base. So if the tax base essentially doesn't change because it's frozen due to the TIF district, the, the tax rate's not gonna change, it's not gonna really increase because it's gonna be spread against the same tax base. That being said, there's no benefit, you know, it doesn't get to decrease because we didn't add that tax capacity for that portion of their funding. So they don't get to benefit from a creation of a TIF district, but in large part, they don't actually have a cost either. It's they the same protected. levy amount. Is they don't benefit, but they get protected from the state on their formula. Yes, and then they, they do get the benefit on the referendum market value side. Right. Okay, and then continue? Yeah. So you're three years into it, you've got a lot of stuff built up because they've got to do it by five years. Um, where does the city get the general levy dollars to support the city services for the new development in a TIF district? Since the taxes generated from the TIF district go back into the TIF district. Yes, that is uh, the ultimate impact of a TIF district is the cost of providing services to that area is not funded by the project. It's, it, that, that cost does end up getting spread against the tax base as a whole. What level of incremental growth there is in the city's cost of services as a result of a specific development is gonna be you know, specific to that scenario, uh, but it's likely to be you know, a portion of this, you know, some, there, there, there's inherently gonna be some, some increase in cost of services due to adding any, you know, you add anything and inherently it, to some degree it adds cost, but that cost does get spread against the tax base as a whole, uh, which usually does soften that impact. <coughs> All right. Councilor Luce. Just as long as he's on that subject. Um, I did a quick scenario and the impact to other areas is ballpark of 12%. It's a very, you know, Darren could probably make it a little better than I can, but. Um, what are you trying to, a scenario that came out at 12% of what? Well, if you've got a scenario where the school district needs more dollars and they level you the rest of the city, the portion that the TIF district isn't paying gets put on the rest of the city, correct? For the school no. district? Or? Yes. No. Well, the, like the school district wouldn't benefit, but their, their levy amount would still be the same and it would still be spread against the entirety but, of the school district. Right, but they can't use the dollars from the TIF district, so they have to make it up on the rest of the no. city. Well, they don't get to benefit. It, only their, their benefit is in the tax capacity. Yeah. 
They take they take the full, value full they take the value cash. of the whole school district yep. area and they say the value is twenty five bucks. <coughs> and if we're gonna put a twenty five dollar levy out there, it's gonna be uh, you know one percent for each. Since we can't add this other development over here and make our total capacity fifty dollars, when we spread the twenty five dollars to it, it would be a half a percent to each. So they don't get to add that extra capacity of value. Right, that's what I'm getting at, but there is an impact to the rest of the city by having... It makes the their, tax, their tax rate look high. Correct. Now, uh, one other thing, fiscal disparities has been bumped around here a couple of times, and I just want to <laughs> make sure we got this right. The money in a, tax, in a TIF district pays no fiscal disparities, correct? No, I don't does, think it does. does pay. They pay fiscal does disparities. Pay. It does and pay fiscal disparities. They pay the state commercial tax. But a residential but, one. But, but recognize fiscal disparities is only dealing with commercial properties, commercial. not residential. Correct. Commercial. The state always gets theirs. I think the state is ex ex exempt from the TIF. I mean, they're, they're the one entity that, no matter what, <coughs> can't get hijacked. So, they so, do the hijacking. So, Mayor and Council, the best mix of best thing to have is a mixed use project because a residential there is no fiscal disparities there is no state commercial tax so you get the TIF district gets a hundred percent and that's why I think if you look at just the road and the hundred million dollar investment they can pay that off pretty quickly versus if you look at Seagate they were not able to pay theirs off because they're still paying fiscal disparities they're still paying the state commercial tax so commercial property is more difficult in a TIF district, and you have to get that all done in the five years, and that's why in a redevelopment district, they make it a longer period of time to be able to ha capture some more of that cost, because they assume some of it's going to be commercial. Yeah, if you were to look at a commercial tax bill versus how much was captured by TIF, it's usually about a third that actually is TIF eligible on a commercial property, because the state commercial tax and the fiscal disparities portions are so high. You can choose to capture the fiscal disparities portion in a TIF district if you wanted to, but that's something that the council is able to determine at the time that they create a TIF district. Huh? Other questions? I mean, this pretty wide ranging uh, general discussion on TIF. Um, I want to th <coughs> thank you very much for coming. Uh, Michael, do you have any follow up comments? Yes, sir. Um, you know, for our community here, I. You know, we've had 16 other districts in our community outside of the original Kmart one. Um, I don't believe any of those have failed. Um, I know that some have been so successful that they've actually outgrown that dollar amount faster than what was projected, and they were decertified uh, much sooner than the original plan. Um, but I think this has been a good discussion. Um, Councilor Luce, Councilor Lamon, Councilor Mokel, uh, Councilor Whiting, did you find value in tonight's discussion? I have one last question. Yeah. Um, the last question was, in a typical case, if there is a default, then who pays for the improvements? I, I, it's one, I, there's two scenarios I heard, is there more? One scenario is um, the developer or whoever, the landowner, whoever puts up some kind of a bond, a surety bond, um, that you can fall back on so there's no risk to the city. The other one that I heard was uh, um, there is no surety and if the developer goes bankrupt or something, uh, the city's got a road to pay for. Is there any other in <coughs> there that are normal? So, so Mayor and Council, let's just use it. Some TIF area and the developer is building the road and then getting the TIF to reimburse building that road. Just like any project, we would have their contractor and others provide us with security and the developer provide us with security because they're going to have to go out to a bank basically and finance that. We could write the agreement that for whatever section they only get that portion to make sure it's finished. So they wouldn't get their TIF dollars, they would get the guarantee of the TIF dollars but not the actual dollars until the road is actually finished. If the road wasn't finished, we would then call on their guarantees to finish the road. Okay. And the other scenario where you don't do a pay as you go and it's just a standalone where you're not getting any kind of I think reassurances, then what happens? The council's been 
pretty good, I think, since the 90s. They're all pay as you go. Pay as I you think go. based yeah. on our financial advisor, that's kind of the model most places are using because it puts all the onus back on the developer. Well, and I'm, I'm, and I'm asking because I want to know, you know, how is it done in other locations when it's not pay as you go and there's not a surety? What happens then? Do they, does the city put a lien on the property for that amount or? Yeah, if there's no, if the city is, the cities have the right to undertake TIF tax increment districts and to fund projects such as a roadway under the issue, using the issuance of debt. They could issue, uh, typically it would have to be general <coughs> obligation uh, TIF revenue debt. In which case, if the TIF revenue is short, the city would be obligated to make up any shortfall through generally obligated t uh, tax dollars. So ultimately in that case, if the city were to choose to go that route, that is a risk that the city has taken on is that <coughs> there's the potential that uh, the TIF revenue could come in differently, the project could not happen, it could be you know, developed at a lower rate. All these things are considerations, which is part of why when we talk about these and we talk about pay as you go versus uh, bonding, we talk about where that risk threshold is for the city and where that risk falls. The risk performance is in, an, in a bonded situation does fall on the city's on the city side of the ledger, as opposed to on a pay-as-you-go where that risk is then put on the developer the, in regards to performance. Uh, some things that can mitigate that are certain timing considerations for when that debt might be issued. Uh, you can issue it, you know, potentially if you can have the development start to happen or have construction be completed, you could issue that debt, you know, if the timing works out regard, based on the improvement, you can issue that debt following the completion of a substantial portion of those improvements, you know that value is going to be there. Right. And even if that per particular developer is not able to complete the project, somebody's usually going to come in and complete that and that tax base is still going to be there. Uh, so you can time, sometimes you can have timing considerations, sometimes you can have uh, letters of credit to get through that timing period if you have to issue the debt in advance of the project being completed. That's where that letter of credit comes in. So you've got that backstop to make sure that the project gets completed and that tax value comes online. But those are considerations that the city will, would have to undertake if they're looking at a bonded scenario such as that. And that's why we talk about bonded versus pay as you go is to try to shift as much of that risk profile onto the, de onto the developer. When you say <laughs> as much as possible, is there a, a, a line in there that's all instead of as much as? All the risk? Yeah, that, that would go. be a pay as you go agreement. Yeah. It would be all oh, of the yeah. risk would be on the developer to make sure that that project's completed and they get repaid. Great. Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Kersky, what has what traditionally Shakopee done in regards to TIF? Well, I wasn't here in the 90s, but all the documents that currently are in place are all pay as you go. Thank you. Pay as you go. Mm -hmm. No, oh, no risk to the it, city. It, it, it would be hard press from a staff level to recommend. Yeah a TIF that puts the onerous upon the city as opposed right. to a developer. Right. And we want, you know, developments to the best and highest use and we want them to actually exceed the expectations. That's the, that's the key for me and I know a couple of these districts have done exactly that. Uh, Seagate was brought out in an example. I believe Imagine Printing was actually, uh, their value went up so high that they, uh, got decertified much quicker than planned. Um, some of these other ones are older, but uh, um, you know, the, the economic development and redevelopment to bring jobs and all that that goes with it uh, is a benefit. And certainly our city has been conservative enough to protect the taxpayer. Um, and I think that's vitally important. And that's why I say there's not one district, TIF district in the city of Shakopee that has failed. Hey, Mayor and Council, I'll point out as Darren and I have been talking, most of these are coming due in 2022, I think through 2025, 26, it's going to be huge, a significant amount of revenue is going to be flowing to the city, just like it happened with um, Seagate. I mean, it went from zero to $180,000 a year. We're going to have that same benefit in the 2020 timeframe. Uh, just a, another comment, uh, when we've done some of the commercial industrial uh, incentive programs, we have that policy in place that says you have to, we require you to have a certain amount of jobs at a certain rate of pay and, and, and we have some criteria 
And we also look for those community partners like uh, uh, Council Member Luce pointed out with RAR. Um, we're looking for something to come back and sometimes it's, it's a financial part of it, but sometimes it's that, that corporate uh, citizen that we're looking for. Uh, yeah, and we're talking about Canterbury, who's been a tremendous partner of Absolutely. our community for a very long time. Maybe not 140 years or whatever it is for RAR, but certainly a, a major stakeholder in our city, in our community, in our county um, from that aspect, so. Absolutely. Did, uh, did a resident want to comment uh, just briefly on this discussion? Yeah, can I ask a question? You could come forward here and state your name and address to the record. I'm Bob Weichel, I live at 634th Avenue East and in regard to the TIF, um, I understand that in the contract there is, like Jay had, uh, or Councilor Whiting had mentioned, um, jobs. So many jobs that pay so much money. Who, who and how is that held accountable? And if it is not achieved, what happens? Uh, Michael can give, and we have some recent examples, actually. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, you know, the state requires, uh, so if you pass a TIF that is an economic incentive to a corporation, the state has all sorts of reporting requirements and audit requirements. So we just recently, um, you have a MIF loan with, um, no. Shutterfly. The, thank you. <laughs> you, have, you have a MIF loan with Shutterfly, so the incentive for them to hire up and meet it is that note becomes due and payable, so they would have had to pay back a million dollars. Yeah. They were just audited by um, the state of Minnesota and actually exceeded their hiring requirement and far exceeded their wage requirement, I believe. They came on board before you change it to $19, so it was $15 or $16 an hour. Their average wage is $25 an hour. I think the number was 256. You granted them a year extension. They were at over 270 when they were audited. But in one year, they did not get their full value. They got yes, it prorated. Sir. Because oh, last sure. year, they lost some. Yeah, yeah <coughs> prorated, down. Just, yes. just for the public's deal, MIF loan is what? Minnesota Investment Fund, I believe. Minnesota Investment Fund. Yeah. That's a I want to um, the public to know. Thank you. state program where they give us the money and we loan it out, but we're on the hook for the Does money. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Huh? Thank you. Yep. Excellent. Um, this, uh, and the same thing is required in a TIF, so they're audited by us, and we just don't take their records, actually, for Shutterfly. Deed gets their actual employment records. We actually get the name of every employee, how much they're paid, what their benefits are. Councilor Lehman? To, to answer your question, I don't, I don't think anybody really answered your question. I think this chart kind of answers it. And uh, there's different kinds of TIFs. One might be a jobs-related TIF. One might be a, a slummed out area that's losing value substantially and you know it's just that you want to do something different with it and bring it back up. <clears throat> that doesn't have a job requirement to it. <coughs> It's not that I'm aware of. Um, you've got, according to this, you've got low income housing, no jobs created. Um, manufacturing, there's your jobs. Contaminated soils, you know, they don't count the jobs of the company that's gonna come in and take out the soil and make sure it's disposed of properly because they're not, jobs are gonna stay within the community. Brownfield development. Right, right? I mean, yeah. So I think the answer to your question that you were asking about the job requirement, the job requirement, at least, and I'm not speaking for everybody but myself here, but at least in my mind, we have what we call a business subsidy policy um, where we as a council set the standards that we want to see in our community if, in order to even be eligible to ask for any kind of assistance um, separate from a TIF district and then a, a TIF district that would have uh, uh, under economic development for manufacturing or jobs, that would have a separate set of guidelines, and by all means, staff can correct me, um, above and beyond our local business subsidy policy, um, a lot of that's from the state. Is that? Yes, sir, that's correct, and uh, council just recently, uh, uh, six months ago, uh, had increased uh, 
uh, what you determined yeah. was uh, acceptable uh, for, yeah. for that ask, as you yeah. pointed out. Excellent follow-up here. I, I would point out that it is the city's policy for what those goals would be that would that the t that a business subsidy under TIF would point to. So you get to set right. TIF, MIF, whatever qualifies as a business subsidy. You get to set that policy for goals and levels of jobs created. Right. That's not set by the state. They just monitor to make sure it's met. Councilor okay. Whiting. And I just wanted to point out when we. Uh, the most recent one that I was involved with uh, was right after, you know, the economy kind of took a turn and everybody was kind of thinking the economy was still going to be unstable and that was when we did the Sandmar project and uh, we kind of got our feet wet. Um, with that one, it was a little lower rates than we, we uh, moved to. I think it was the 12 to $14 rates, but uh, that was at a, a different economic time. So I think it, it depends on where you're at as an as a economy and, and different things. So um, it can be a sliding scale, I guess. That was a redevelopment of an existing facility with an expansion, I believe. That was actually a, a greenfield. New facility. New facility. A brand new facility. Oh, okay. Yeah. But there's, uh, yeah, so some of these would be, uh, like, I, I don't know, did we do a RAR under redevelopment or how did, how? Economic. That was economic. Yeah, okay. that's across the street. There was a new development. Right. All right. Great discussion. I know, uh, you know, every, uh, we come, we never stop learning and uh, understand more. I appreciate the staff from Springsteen. That was great. Michael, thank you for your effort. Um, so if there's no further discussion on that, we can move forward. Um, 11A, uh, city bill list is here for our preview, purview. Um, no action needed on that. And we can do our liaison and our administration report, Councilor Lehman. School board meeting. Um, my notes are out in my car. What did they discuss? Um, the who's who's walking and busing to which school? Big issue. Yeah, Redo, really uh, yeah redoing the lines. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a tough it's, issue. It is. You know, it really is. Um, there was. Uh, a lot of talk about the financial. They looked at a policy, some policy changes. The two that stuck out was uh, the uh, credit card use policy. Some changes coming there. Um, what was the other one? God, I, I had good notes in my car and I forgot it. I'll, uh, I'll just put it together, send it to Reynolds, and he can put it out the rest of you. Right, thank you. Um, I've met with staff a couple of times. Um, I just, I have some things coming up here. Uh, we are gonna meet with the city and the school district and the county and discuss school crossings, uh, which have uh, been highlighted lately. So we're gonna have a, a meeting here in the next week or so. Um, we have the fireman dance coming up at Turtles on Friday night. We have Envision Shakopee on 1012 at the community center at 6.30. And again, fire prevention week begins and we're gonna have a open house on uh, October 14th at station number one. Um, a great thing to go climb on some trucks. Councilor Whiting. Well, thank you. On the 27th, I had the MVTA meeting. Um, they're still looking at their, uh, their new CAD AVL system that kind of runs the, the whole system there, uh, looking at that, that purchase. A lot of discussion on how uh, how transit's going to be funded with uh, changes in the RAM vest and the MIN vest, which are all uh, different former ways of funding transit. So uh, that's still up in the air. On uh, today, uh, I had the Main Street Steering Committee. Uh, they had their annual review with the, uh, the Minnesota Main Street program. Um, they talked about some upcoming events. Uh, Ladies' Night Out is on the 12th of October coming up. Uh, Trick or Treat on Main Street is uh, October 28th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. A little early, but those get them out early. Holiday Fest is scheduled for, uh, it's gonna be two days, uh, uh, December 1st and December 2nd. And uh, actually there's talk of a parade that's included in that and fireworks for the Holiday Fest. So that's something new, that's exciting. Um, I got a, a marketing report from the Rhythm on the Rails program. Uh, just to let you know, um, they included all the events, and two of them were, one was a rain delay and one was a, was a rain out completely, yeah. but 
with that included in their average, they had uh, 2,940 average attendance with uh, the Chris Hockey Night, I think it was uh, 5,184 <laughs> people downtown. So that was a good thing. I can pass that around, kind of gives you a little idea what uh, what some of their things, they had a nice, nice report on how that went. So that's great for downtown. Um, I also uh, attended Pablo's grand reopening the other night, uh, Friday night, uh, at a band in, on Main Street again, kind of like the mm -hmm. Rhythm on the Rails. Uh, um, great night, uh, another uh, successful uh, use of our facade loan program and uh, um, beautiful production they put on. So that's all I have. I have a question. The council? Did they happen to say when men's night was? It, no, I asked. <laughs> I didn't say. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did mention Matt? something. Uh, what, what about us? Agree. Yeah. Elsa Rocco. Uh, SDA was postponed from last Thursday to this Thursday, so I have an update on that. So, um, SPUC meeting, um, they talked about the Windermere project. They are complete with phase one, um, and they were doing ongoing pressure testing right now. Um, they also went over their nitrate report for the city of Shakopee, and um, you know, one of the things that they talked about was their requirements versus the state requirements and um, but as we we dug into some of the different wells and their um, runoff we they were finding that um, some of the resi newer residential has um, higher nitrate um, levels and they were saying it's you would think it would be the agriculture but they were saying that farmers usually look at the cost of the of what of the runoff versus you know, in residential, they're more cognizant of the green lawns, and so they want to green lush very quickly, and so that that causes those um, nitrates to go into those wells faster. Um, but we, for Shakopee, we still are at a very low level compared to the statewide. Um, and they were also talking about their um, treatments, you know, if something does go wrong, but um, those can get expensive. Um, as far as outages, um, they had um, 20th, on the 20th um, of September, the Valley View for 40 minutes for one customer. Um, apparently they had a <coughs> setting on a switch from when it converted from one system to the other um, that needed to be replaced. Um, on the 23rd, there was Shakopee Avenue dig. Um, it affected two customers for 90 minutes. And then over the weekend, they had three outages and one was due to a dead tree of 710 customers and that was, um, they had 85% of those customers up in the first hour. It's a dead tree? A dead tree fell on the line, oh, so, fell down. yep. Um, and then they were also talking about, they had dug into their um, Google Analytics for their website, and um, what they had found is that they had 200 plus people trying to access um, the packets for the meeting. And so they had decided that um, as of the first of the year, Spuck will be making their packets available to the general public. Oops. So, and that is all we have. Thank you very much. Now one of the highlights, the administrator report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had my first Metro Cities board meeting on 21 September. Uh, got to meet the new Met Council Chair, uh, and as well made uh, a few appointments uh, both to the techni Technical Advisory Committee and the GIS Board. One of the interesting things that I noted uh, in looking at uh, all of where all the appointments were from, especially for the TAC and the TAB, the Technical Advisory Committee and the Transportation Advisory Board is that there are none from Scott County uh, noted, uh, and we will work on that in the future. Uh, uh, on 27 September, I uh, attended the Highway 169 Mobility Study Policy Advisory Committee, uh, and they're in the process of uh, looking at some of their test results that they had just recently uh, done. And essentially what they're looking to do is to look at uh, our bus transportation system with several goals in mind, saving money, and then saving the time that each person has to spend to get from point A to point B. Uh, and then judging what the impact of that will be on ridership. Why do, why do we care? Well, as we look at some of the, the tests that they are conducting, uh, test one uh, essentially is looking to remove stations at Southbridge Crossing, Pioneer Trail, and Cedar Lake Road. Test two is to remove stations at Southbridge Crossing, Pioneer Trail, and Cedar Lake Road uh, as well uh, with some other uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, inline uh, changes overall. 
Test three is to remove stations at Southbridge Crossing, Pioneer Trail, Cedar Lake Road, and Theodore Worth Parkway. You can see there is a trend here. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, got a lot of data that I will send out to all of you uh, uh, tomorrow, so you can then take a look at it, and uh, uh, then uh, also uh, we'll put it online as well. But uh, obviously that uh, that's a, that is concerning. Now yeah. it saves money, it saves time for some people. The question is, those that use Southbridge Station, are they going to be willing to to use Marshall Road or yeah. another station, or are they just going to drive into the city as well? You know, ultimately, that's yeah. that's an individual decision. But I'll get that information out to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, let's see. As the mayor said, the Fire Relief Association annual dance is at 8 p.m. Uh, this Friday, October 6, at T Turtle Social Center. Uh, Rhythm on the Rails received the 2017 uh, Main Street Event Award. That's right. I forgot to mention. Uh, this that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, a first-time event, and and they received the right. award for the state of Minnesota. Absolutely, so excellent job. Uh, with Elliot and all of the work that he's done with that. Uh, and finally, uh, as you know, we've tried uh, a lot of uh, community outreach. Uh, you know, I've had multiple coffees with the administrator. We've had uh, where I've actually had all of the department heads available for interaction with the public. Uh, well, we're going to try something new and different. Uh, one Monday night at a, a time to be noted, we're going to have beer with the administrator uh, at Badger Hill. Uh, and this is actually something that's been very effective in other communities. And uh, initially when I thought about it, I'm like, eh, it's a little sketchy for me. But then looking at some of the videos where they've actually done this in other communities and essentially, uh, uh, you know, had uh, the ability to, to reach a segment of the population that may not be interested in being at, uh, at uh, 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 Starbucks at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. So uh, we're going to try that, and there will be more information on that as it, it comes out in the future. That's all I have, sir. Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much. Um, there is, looks like there's no other business in front of this council. Uh, entertain a motion. Councilor Moko. I'll make a motion to adjourn to October 17th, 2017 at 7 p.m. I have a motion and a second by Councilor Whiting. Uh, discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.